All right, let's get busy. Whoa, it's moving. All right, so uh, sorry about that little technical difficulty there, but uh, hey, I want to welcome everybody to our Saturday morning note wholesaling blueprint training. And um, today I'm going to share with you a lot of things that I did in 2017 that ultimately increased our business by 143%. So hopefully you guys and gals have got uh, something to write with and uh, something to write on because I'm going to be throwing a lot of things at you throughout the course of the day. And I would highly encourage you to take notes along the way so that you can apply these things to your business. Now, one of the most valuable opportunities in the area of real estate notes is note wholesaling. Now, why do I say that? Well, because any other opportunity in the space of real estate notes requires cash and lots of it. So whether you're buying performing notes or non-performing notes, if you're actually buying them, you have to have cash to do it. And there's no getting around it. And you can get cash in a lot of different ways through lines of credit, equity lines of credit, JV partnerships, and things of that nature. But if you don't have those types of resources readily available to you, then I would highly encourage you to focus in on note wholesaling as an entry point to getting started in the business. Now, why do I say that? Well, 21 years ago, when I got started in the note business, this is exactly what I did. And here I am 21 years later, and I'm still doing it. Now, why is it that I do note wholesaling? Well, simple. Not every note deal that I see do I want to keep today. 21 years ago, I did it because I didn't have any money. I didn't have any cash. I didn't have any capital. I didn't have any lines of credit. I didn't have houses and things like that that I could leverage to pull equity out of, which I don't necessarily I, – I don't necessarily recommend in all cases, by the way. But at the end of the day, I had one way to do it, and that was note wholesaling. Now, the thing that I've learned over the years and what I love about note wholesaling is that I can literally take advantage of every single note deal that comes across my desk because of the different things that I know about note wholesaling that allow me the opportunity to capitalize on every single deal. Now, whether that's I'm buying it for myself or I'm gonna put it under contract and I'm gonna assign it to somebody else, those are just a couple of options in the space that allow you and me to take advantage of it. So the beautiful thing about that is our opportunity cost becomes very fluid. In other words, our opportunity cost go down and our investment goes up because we're spending less time accomplishing more, which is a good thing in business no matter what. So what is note wholesaling? Well, it's really easily explained in, uh, in these terms. What you have is you've got a property, and I'm just gonna draw something like a house here. By the way, you don't have to be an artist to be in this business. So you've got a house, which ultimately creates a note. And right here, the seller now has cash locked up in their note. In other words, they can't do anything else with it. Now, why is that important? Why is that something that may or may not work for that seller? Well, if you think about it, What's the number one thing that investors are always looking for? They're always looking for cash. They're always looking for opportunities to, let me pull this a little closer, um, to get and to buy more homes, more, more houses, more properties in their local area. Well, if their money is tied up in a house or in a property for that matter, now they're, at a, they're at a loss. They're stopped in their business. Now, I know that there are a lot of people out there that ultimately preach cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And that's a great model. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm talking about here 
is somebody who's gone out, they've purchased a property, they've fixed up that property, they borrowed money to buy it, they borrowed money to fix it, and now in order for them to get their payday or to get their reward from that particular property, they ultimately have to sell that note in order to do that. Because there's a couple of things that are ultimately going on behind the scenes. Number one is because they borrowed money, there's a cost of capital that's going on behind the scenes. Because they put their own money or they may have even borrowed money to fix up the property, there's a cost of capital there. There's a cost of opportunity there. And so any equity or any upside potential that they, that they can benefit from on that house is now locked up in the form of a note. Now, they may, and hopefully they are, getting regular payments on that note. And those regular payments are certainly debt servicing the hard money lender or the private money lender that lent them money to buy the house and could potentially be debt servicing even a second on that property for fix for the uh, fixing up of the house or the property. But at the end of the day, just because they're getting cash flow, and this is one of those things they don't ever seem to tell you about cash flow, it's just because you're getting $500 a month payment over here, doesn't necessarily that that equates to $500 profit over here. Okay? So what I've found is when I've talked to these sellers or note holders, one of the things that they're motivated by on a regular basis is turning their property. Why are they motivated by it? Because that's their primary business. That's what they do for a living. And if you can show them how to turn their properties faster, and you can show them how to return or turn their properties more efficiently and more effectively and achieve, and achieve a higher pay price for the notes that they're ultimately creating and or carrying back, then now you're developing a relationship with that particular seller that you have now added value to their business model. That's the number one thing that people are looking for in this business. They're looking for people to add value to their business. Just like you and I, when we go out to a restaurant or we go to a store or we go to any type of event or training or anything, what we're looking for is value. What we're looking for are moments and opportunities where we can apply those to our business or our life or uh, an experience which also has value, aka vacations and things of that nature. So the same model, the same motivation is there for them. How can I get value out of selling my note? What value do I get by selling the note to you, Troy? What value do I get in, out of selling the note to anybody else? And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how to show them where the value really lies in liquidating that note and selling it to you and allowing you to wholesale it. Or if you're in a position to buy it, you can certainly purchase it as well. My focus today is going to be on wholesaling notes, but at no time am I going to discourage anybody from buying notes if they've got the capital to do it. But here's something I learned last November at an event in Dallas, Texas. As I walked around the event, and there was about four to 500 people at the event, I would say 80% of the people at the event had never done a deal before. 80% of the people were limited on cash and capital. They were also limited on the amount of knowledge and direction that they needed to grow their business. And as I walked around the event, and it was a great event by a good, fr by a good friend of mine that, uh, that put it on, and I enjoyed being there, and it was, it was certainly an opportunity to even speak there at the event. But one of my takeaways, and now let me, let me clarify something here, because that experience there today, or that experience in November, was no different than any experience that I've ever had over the last 20 years of, 21 years of going to events. Meaning that 
a lot of times you go to the events and there's a lot of people in, at the event that have never closed a deal before. They are unaware and unsure of how to go about doing that and how to accomplish that first task. Or maybe if they did do one, they don't know how to really scale their business. They don't know how to move their business in the direction of their goals and their dreams and their desires. And you know what? And that's, that's okay. That means that they're in a perfect place in a perfect environment to come alongside and to teach them really how to scale and how to build their business. And that was my takeaway from November's event is that it was the same exact feeling as any other event I'd ever gone to. Now there were some people there that were knocking the cover off the ball. Don't get me wrong. There were some people doing amazing things. And my role at the event was one to speak. And then number two, I just maintained a really low profile because I wanted to spend the majority of my time observing people in what they were asking, the types of questions they were asking, asking the types of things that they were looking for, and what in their eyes were they really needing in order to succeed. And so I took away a couple of things from that event. I'm going to share those with you throughout the course of this of today. Um, like I said, I'm not picking on the event. It was put on by a great friend of mine and uh, a person that I, I fully admire and respect in the industry. But I've learned after 21 years in this industry that the industry as a whole, we are terrible at creating success. Just going to tell you straight up. I'm just going to, you know, I've been, I was debating on whether to talk about this right now, but I think it's important. I got to get, I got to get that out of here. I just got to put it out there on the table. And that is we're terrible at creating success. And that goes for all genres, meaning even the fix and flip guys and the, and the, and the big players and all these other, and the, and all the people, and I'm not going to name names. You, you know who they are. You've seen them and things like that. They have great content. They have great information. They have poor execution. And today I'm gonna to talk about execution. Today I'm gonna to talk about how you can execute on your own, but I'm also gonna give you an opportunity later on if you wanna join me in a very private mastermind opportunity, I'm gonna talk about that later on today. But more importantly, I wanna to bring to you the, the tools necessary so that you understand the basics and even the intermediate and the advanced techniques on wholesaling real estate notes. Now, why am I starting in this place? Well, I talked about that a little bit ago, and that is because this is exactly where I started. So I'm going to show you how I got started, how I continue to, to succeed in this niche space, and how you can do the same thing for yourself. And it's not difficult. It does require effort. It does require work. It does require time. But if you're willing to add those ingredients to what I'm going to share with you today, there's no reason why you can't go out and close deals and be successful. And success is different in everybody's eyes. Some people just want to close one deal a month. Some people, their goal is to close 10 deals a month. And those are different levels of success and they require different amounts of attention and effort to accomplish one versus the other. So I'm gonna spend my day sharing these things with you. Over the Christmas break, there was, you know, we, my, uh, Kim and I talked about what can be different in 2018 that was from 2017. What can we do different as investors and educators, and how can we help our Pinnacle family to grow their business? And so hopefully you'll see what that looks like today, because I'm gonna be discussing some of, a lot of that today, and we're gonna be moving forward in a fashion that's very different in 2018 than we ever did in 2017, 16, 15, and, and so on. And our goal, is to be disruptive in the industry in a very positive way, in a very positive way. We're not here to put down anything or anybody in what they've done or they haven't done in the course of the industry. What we're here to do is to change the direction of the industry 
so the students themselves benefit and get value out of the money that they've invested in education. And I'm going to share with you why I do certain things because I also invest in education. I also invest in coaching and things of that nature, but I have a very specific strategy in how I go about doing it so that I can monetize that investment so that I can monetize the, um, the goal that I want to get out of that particular investment. And that's important to me. And I think by talking, having talked to several of you over the, uh, over the last year or so that it's important to um, each and every one of you. So I'm going to share with you how I do even that aspect of my business, how I surround myself with people that actually help me to level up. And even after 21 years in the business, I still want to grow my business. I still want to level up each and every year. I want to get better every year. I want to get better every day. I want to get better every month, not only in the area of business, but in personal life and in my finances and in my spirituality and everything else. So that's what I'm going to spend today sharing with you. Hopefully you're excited. Obviously, um, we had uh, over 400 people sign up for today's uh, webinar. I know it's going to be a long one or live webcast, I guess. I know it's going to be a long day, um, but hopefully you'll get a lot of nuggets out of this and hopefully you'll be able to take those and apply them to your business. So back to wholesale. So as investors create these notes, one of the things that they're, that they're ultimately doing is they're actually part of the solution. Oftentimes people forget this aspect of, I'm going to stand over, see if I can stand over here a little bit better. Um, people often, so let me back up here a little bit. So in our business, people often look at this as being, okay, financial, 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 money, 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 grow, grow, grow. Well, that's great, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the simplicity behind it is, that this person who's buying this house cannot be cannot income qualify through traditional means. So the individual selling them that house is actually blessing them and helping them out. In other words, giving them a hand up in the area of home ownership. Now, because that person's done that, he or she has put themselves in a position where they now have locked up their cash and capital in the form of a note. So then the next question is, what do they do with it? Because what they've been told is cash flow is good. Cash flow is good. And there's no, there's no argument for me in that space. Cash flow is very good. There's nothing wrong with cash flow. But what I've learned over the years is that these notes I would say at least 90% of the deals I do have debt associated with them. Meaning that these notes, even though it's a $100,000 note and they may be collecting $900 a month payment, they've got five to $600 a month going out in the form of payments to their investors or JV partners. And because of that, their cash flow is very limited. It's typically less than about 30% of the overall payment. So now you have to look at it, okay, what kind of opportunity costs are at risk when you lock up the cash and the capital inside of this note? And the opportunity costs are huge for an, for an individual or a company that's doing fix and flip real estate. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if they've got their money for this property locked up in this note and another property comes along, they may have a hard time putting that other property under contract and they may have a hard time borrowing money from this particular investor again because that investor is saying, okay, wait a minute. We lent you money. You've been paying on us. We're happy that you've been paying on us. But the term of this money is getting ready to expire. So what does that look like? And ultimately, 
he or she is going to have to sell this note in order to satisfy the terms of that underlying capital. It also coordinates to another question or correlates to another question, and that is, do they want to continue receiving 20, 30% of the overall payment and the maintenance and the management cost of debt servicing this particular loan? Or would they prefer a lump sum payment at the end of the day? And I've never ever had anybody tell me that they would prefer the payment over the lump sum payment. Now, why is that? Well, later on today, I'm gonna to share with you the disparity or the, the difference between the two. It's substantial. And because of that, when you, when you share with somebody just what the real numbers are in a deal and what they're really making versus what they're sacrificing, it's a no-brainer for them to sell me the note, even at a discount, even at 70 cents on the dollar. All of those things no longer are an issue in my conversations with them. Why? Well, because when I'm talking with them, I'm walking them through the process of saying, hey, you know, you've, got all, you've worked hard. You borrowed money. You put in your own money. You rehab this whole house. You spent hundreds of hours remodeling this property. You've now sold it to an individual over here in the form of a note. Now you need to get your money out of that note. And until you get that money out of that note, this cycle is not complete. The cycle is not complete. God, and God forbid that the person who is paying on this note defaults. Because if that happens, that means any underlying debt over here is 100% their responsibility. Just like a rental property. Having a rental property, at the end of the day, that rental property is your responsibility as a landlord to make that monthly payment on that rental property in be while you have tenants or even if you're in between tenants. It's still your responsibility. So. Where does this, how does this benefit you? Well, it's simple. If you can come along and play the role of a consultant and you can get a bank to buy that note, stand over here, then that will produce a payday for you. But here's the thing, and this is where, this is the importance of how to grow your business. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be sharing things with you throughout today that really speaks to the entrepreneur side of each and every one of you. I've been an entrepreneur since I was 16 years old. I grew up in a family we had nine different corporations as a kid. My, my parents owned businesses, my grandparents owned businesses, my aunts and uncles owned businesses. So I was constantly around business. All the while I playing sports and going to school, probably the biggest impact was being around business owners and listening and learning from them on a regular basis. Now all of them had different businesses in different fields of industry, different areas of expertise. And so I had a wide, a wide variety of input or influence from all of them. And I took away from all of those experiences, I tried to take away from all those experiences, the best of the best and the things that apply here. And one of the number one things that apply in, as a consistent factor in all of those businesses was value. What value did they bring? See, and the value that you bring here is knowing where he or she or they can sell this note. Who can actually get them a pricing on that note that's consistent to what their wants and needs are? Well, the truth is, 
you have to be dealing with institutional banks to accomplish those goals. You have to be working with institutional capital to accomplish those goals. Now, why do I say that? Because their cost of capital is cheaper than anybody else's cost of capital, meaning that they're the ones that are lending to you and me to buy homes at 3% interest. Now, I'm sure if I poll all of you about the question, would you be interested in lending your money out at 3% or 4% interest, you'd probably say, no, I'm not interested in that. Now, some of you may be okay with it, but the majority of you would say no. So if somebody's over here and their cost of capital is prime, which is usually what it is, um, prime plus or minus, then if they're over here buying a note at say a seven, eight, nine, 10, eleven percent yield, depending upon its credit grade, now all of a sudden you can achieve a higher price point for that note seller. Not to mention, you can also achieve a higher fee for yourself at the end of the day. So what does that look like? Well, if you're over here and you're marketing to these types of investors, which is what you should be doing. That's what they call target marketing, okay? And target marketing is where you get your best results, you get your best rewards, and you get your highest paydays. Because your time is being spent talking with people who ultimately have something that you want and you have something that they want. In other words, you both bring value to each other. And that will increase your closing percentage. Oftentimes people talk to individuals and investors who really aren't in the market. They haven't created notes. They don't have any notes. They, they're doing their, their, uh, their uh, how you say, um, we call it rental property uh, landlords, and there's nothing wrong with all of those things. But more importantly, when you're talking about an industry that's $1.7 trillion, okay? Our industry is a $1.7 trillion industry. Now, where do I get that statistic? Simple. There's approximately $10 trillion worth of first lien mortgages that are tracked by the U.S. government. In other words, they know about all of the lending that's gone on nationwide. Why? Because the banks are doing the lending, lenders are doing the lending, and they're tracking all of this internally inside of the U.S. government. $10 trillion plus or minus, it fluctuates about 9.8, all the way up to I've seen it as high as uh, $10.4 trillion. The flip side of that is that about 17% on average of the real estate that's sold here in the US, meaning residential real estate, is sold through seller financing. Now, the fact that they're selling with seller financing is not always a want to. Oftentimes, it's a have to. Now, why is it a have to? Well, because maybe the house is located in an area or a zip code that the banks are not necessarily fond of lending in. Maybe the price point of the house is below $100,000, and banks aren't necessarily fond of lending at those price points either. So those areas of the country, those zip codes in the country, that have a tendency to be lower value home or lower price point homes are not necessarily the price point homes that banks and lenders are actively marketing to in order to gain business in. Why aren't they marketing it to those areas? Because it's simple. That is, their opportunity is greater and their payout is greater when they're marketing to higher price point homes, okay? Whether they're doing a $50,000 loan or a $250,000 loan, 
It takes the same amount of time and effort to do it, but on the $50,000 loan, they get substantially less payout. Whereas the $250,000 loan, they get a, a greater payout, they tend to have a different type of clientele, and they also tend to make more money, okay? And less of a default as well. So the banks and institutions have figured that out, and the banks and institutions are going after that space, which leaves this area of, say, around 200000 all the way down to $30,000 price point homes as an open market for seller financing. So you've got these investors that are out there buying these homes in those, in those marketplaces, which, by the way, hats off to those investors. The people that are actually going into communities and areas of the country and buying up these properties and rebuilding them and upgrading them and, and cleaning them up and getting rid of the eyesore that that property once was, I have massive respect for those people that are doing that and for those investors that are doing that. Because to me, they're the foot soldiers of revitalizing neighborhoods around the country. And that to me is a powerful statement of just how good we are as Americans and the goals and the, and the passion to change these areas of the country. And, you know, but that doesn't alleviate the fact that the banks and the institutions may not necessarily feel the same way when it comes to financing this house. So that investor ultimately ends up having to do seller financing, which a lot of times they're, they're happy to do it because it takes it from them having to spend money to manage this property, having to spend money, you know, out of pocket money, paying off, paying the uh, underlying lenders, the hard money lenders, private lenders, wherever they raise their capital from, and now it shifts it into this note paying that. So it moves it into a positive cash flow situation, which is a great thing. But like I said a moment ago, that positive cash flow is typically between 20 and 30% of that payment amount, which on say a $900 note, you're talking about $200, 225 on a $900 payment. So that's a, that's a substantial reduction in what they could be making or they could get out of it but ultimately they're debt servicing that with this note, which means they don't have to take it out of their own pocket. And that's a great thing. But because they're in these neighborhoods in these areas of the country and they're revitalizing these areas and building them back up, the banks and institutions don't necessarily want to be in those areas. It's not because they don't like the communities, but oftentimes because they don't make any money in doing the lending in those communities because they, are typically only getting maybe a point, a point and a half in the lending environment, in the lending arena. And when you talk about a point on a $50,000 note or $75,000 note or even a $1,000 note, you know what the math is on it? Not much, not much. So that's why banks shy away from these areas. But that also is what opens the, the opportunity in those areas for you and me to be a part of those areas and to go in there and not only help them create better quality product, but also come alongside them and say, you know what, let me show you, when you find a buyer for this house, let me show you how to make a, how to create a quality deal that will achieve your strike price or your buyout price on this note. Along the way, because you're adding value here to create this, you're gonna get compensated here by bringing it to a bank who can buy it and buy it at a price and a yield that ultimately is consistent to what their portfolio allows them to do. Now, here's the golden rule in the business. And this is what a lot of times people forget. And that is quality pricing requires quality product. And a lot of times I can tell you from experience when I'm talking to these investors, and they've created notes in the past, the type of notes that they've created are less than ideal. Now, why are they less than ideal? Well, because they didn't know what they didn't know. So 
they did the best they could. But now they figured out that selling a house with no money down to somebody who ultimately um, has a say a 500 credit score or 525 credit score and doing it at a 4% interest rate is not a good formula for seller financing. It's not a good formula for that homeowner and it's not a good formula for them. Why? Well, because number one, they don't have any money down. So that means they have no skin in the game. In other words, they have nothing invested. That's not good. Number two, getting a three or 4% interest rate loan when they didn't have to go through what I would call a full dock model like you have with the banks and the institutions is not good either. Okay, that's not good. And then the fact that they've got poor credit means that that's an indication that they're not paying anybody or paying very few people. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I understand bad things happen to good people. I've had bad things happen to me as well. And at the end of the day, I have to learn from those bad things and I have to do what I need to do to change those types of things that happen in my life. And my life has not been perfect. I've, done, I've made some mistakes along the way and I'm regretful for those mistakes. But I've also, I say, owned it. And by owning it, I got better at it. And by getting better at it, I became, you know, ultimately better on the back on the back side. So my point in this is, if you're if if an investor is going over here, and let's say they're they're buying a house for for forty thousand, and they're putting twenty thousand in it, which is you know sixty, okay, and then the sales price is say $100,000 or maybe 110, okay? They need to be getting 10% down. They need to be doing that at a 10% rate. Oh, and they need to be doing it for 10 to 30 years, okay? Now, why do I say that? Oh, sorry about that. Let me go back here. Now, why do I say that? Well, let me back up here a little bit before I tackle this, and then we're going to wrap up this first session. So they bought the house for $40,000. They put $20,000 into it, so that's $60,000. Now the sales price, let's say it was one hundred and ten. dollars okay? So if the sales price is $110,000, these are brand new pens. Um, and they put down 10%, let's just say they put down an even $10,000. Now all of a sudden the, the note amount is going to be 100 k Well, if you give somebody the keys to a property that you just improved its value on it, you put in money that you borrowed, you put in hard-earned money out of your own pocket, so you have $60,000 cash tied up in this property. Now all of a sudden you sold it to somebody for $110,000 and you didn't pull their credit and you didn't get any money down and you gave them a 4% interest rate for 30 years. You've just created financial suicide on all the hard work and energy that you put into that property. Now, what is that going to translate to when you go to sell this note? If you do that with no money down, no credit check, 3%, 4% interest rate on 30 year terms, it's going to translate to a pay price of probably around 40 to 50% of that loan amount or of that note. So let's say 
that was the case, and I see them on a regular basis, you can actually see investors marketing to that model and attracting that type of model or those types of buyers to them on bandit signs. And you can see them in pretty much every major city in the country where you'll see a roadside sign, three bedroom, two bath house, no credit check, no money down, call. And so what they're doing is they're actually going out and looking for those types of buyers. Guess what they do? They attract those types of buyers. And guess what they do? They sell their houses to those types of buyers. Now, I'm not trying to, I don't have any issue with people wanting to buy things with no money down. And I don't have any issues with people wanting to, um, you know, with, with bad credit or anything of that nature. I'm just saying that it's not a recipe for success when you're creating notes for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you're gonna sell that note, at the end of the day, you're gonna get half of what you think you will. And why is that? Well, a couple of things. The buyer has no skin in the game. He didn't have to do a credit check. You don't know what the borrower's credit is on that particular deal. They don't know what the borrower's credit is on that deal. And on top of it, once a person moves into the property and you create a note and mortgage on that deal, your, that's your deal. Like you own that forever until you can sell it off because that's a legal binding agreement. Even lease agreements are legal binding agreements. Contract for deeds, agreement for deeds, land contracts, lease purchases, option agreements. They're all agreements that lock up that property until some point in the future or until some action or behavior takes place in the future. Meaning the only way you can unravel any of those agreements is if this homeowner stops paying or stops participating, which would result in them stopping to pay, stop paying. But until then, that deal's yours. That deal's theirs. They own it. So if they take it to the marketplace, they end up getting half of what they think they could or half of what they would like out of the deal. Why? Because they're not creating deals and they're not creating product that the marketplace wants to buy. And until they do, they're ultimately locking up their cash and their profit right here. Now I see that and I have a great answer for that. And that is I go back and I help them to structure deals over here so that, that never happens because it only typically takes them one or two times to figure out that that model doesn't work. But unfortunately the cost in figuring that out is typically tens of thousands of dollars of cost. And once it's signed, sealed, and delivered, there's nothing they can do about it. There's nothing they can do about it. Because the homeowner ultimately got what they wanted. No money down house, no credit check, and they got a 3% interest rate, which is phenomenal for the homeowner, but it, but it cuts into the profitability of the note holder because when you calculate in time value of money, it automatically gives them a haircut on that deal. And that's not good. That's not good for them. And that's not good for, the, for this particular buyer as well. That doesn't help either party. So that's an important thing to understand. And unfortunately, most people figure that out after the fact instead of before the fact. In other words, there's that old saying, hindsight's 2020. Well, you're absolutely right. Hindsight is 2020, and we've all been there. But in this case, 
not only is hindsight 2020, but it's going to cost you 20 grand on top of it. So now it's 2020, 20, I guess, is a way of, of putting it. Here's the beauty of this is this term right here 10% down, 10% rate, and a 10 to 30 year term for that for any note deal out there will ultimately create a sweet spot for any note seller or anybody who's creating notes. Now, how do I know that? Well, one, it's 21 years of experience, but number two, it accomplishes some key elements and some key ingredients that start to establish that you're putting together a high quality deal. Number one is, 10% down means that the, bar, the buyer's got skin in the game. We've all had a bicycle. And the first bike we got, we typically got it on our birthday or as a Christmas present or when our grandparents came to town, we got a brand new bike. But it was ultimately a gift from somebody else who worked for the money to pay for that bike. And we can all remember back just how well that worked out because the bike ultimately ended up on the side of the house with a flat tire and a broken chain and some twisted up handlebars and nobody, nobody rode it anymore. But that was completely different on our second bike when we had to actually go out and purchase it and spend our hard earned money from mowing yards or cleaning houses or doing whatever we did for chores or, or uh, area activities. When we went out and bought the next bike, it was garage kept, it was maintained. It was, the, the chain was oil. If the tire got a flat, the flat was fixed that day. My point being is that anytime somebody spends their own money on something, they're gonna treat it differently than if it was given to them. And that's an important thing to understand. That's an important thing to keep in mind when it comes to real estate. When you look at the number of homes, and I know this because I ran the first distressed asset fund on Wall Street, and when we looked at the percentage of homes that were in default in the U.S. marketplace back in 07, 08, 09, and 10. If there was 100 loans in a portfolio, 40 to 60% of the loans were what we call first payment defaults. No money down loans, 100% loan to value or combined loan to value. It was very common and it still is today. There's over $500 billion worth of non-performing loans that have yet to be addressed. And they'll slowly circulate out into the marketplace over time. But when you look at the original docs and you look at the original HUD statements and things of that nature, you'll see the number of people that never put any money down on homes or they defaulted on the first payment because it was way outside of their ability to uh, maintain and or pay. And so, at the end of the day, they lost the home. So having skin in the game changes all of that. The next thing is rate. Well, 10% rate is just an easy common number. It could be 7, could be 8, could be 9. But more importantly, the rate's not 3% or 4%. So here's a quick mathematical equation that you can do in your head. If somebody brings you a note, a $100,000 note right here, and it's got a 30-year term, and it's got a 5% interest rate, and your investor wants a 10% yield or return on his or her money, then you can count on that deal being about 50 cents on the dollar at the end of the day. So the lower the rate, the bigger the discount. The higher the rate, the lower the discount is how it works. But also what plays into it is the terms. The rate and the terms are critical for people doing seller financing 
to create loans that the borrower can pay and can afford to pay. Why is that important? Well, because as note investors, as this bank over here that you're selling the note to and that you're representing the note to, this bank over here doesn't like foreclosures any more than anybody else because foreclosures cost money. The average cost of a foreclosure on an institutional level is $22,000 per foreclosure. Now what, is, now what makes up that number? Well, simply, you've got things like lost interest income. You've got things like back taxes. You've got things like escrow, HOAs. You've got legal costs. You've got title costs. You've got valuation costs. You've got property inspection costs. Um, sometimes you even got like electricity costs and stuff like that. All of those things make up that number. Not to mention that that capital still has to be addressed. So the capital doesn't just sit there free and clear in that bank. There's a cost to the bank for that capital as well. So they've got to pay that cost also. So anytime somebody says, well, you can just foreclose on it. Be very careful about those types of questions or those types of statements because it literally is a recipe for disaster at the end of the day. And that's, and those are the types of things we want to avoid in the business. Today's webinars, live streaming is all about showing each of you how to create quality deals, how to build a quality business and how to create quality income for you going forward. And part of that is breaking out of the norm of people saying, well, no big deal, just foreclose on it. No big deal, just do this. Well, every time they say no big deal, that has a dollar sign associated with it. And that dollar sign is what eats up the profit on every single deal. So think about it for this, think about it just real quick and then we'll wrap this up. So if this bank buys a note, and this deal goes into foreclosure. Not only do they have the foreclosure costs, the interest costs, the taxes, um, property insurance, forced placed insurance, um, HOAs if, it, if it's uh, associated with an HOA, they have all of these additional costs, but at the end of the day, this cost now comes out of their bottom line profit. And that $100,000 note that they bought on a $110,000 house that this person's lived in for nine months while it went through the foreclosure process now is not in the same condition as when it was when they originally moved in the house. So where does this house go back to? Well, it goes back to the investor pool. You know, the pool that I, I told you that I, I think is an amazing group of individuals and I still feel that way. They're the ones that are going to ultimately end up buying that. But if they buy it, they want to buy it at what? A discount. Why? Because now they got to go back in and fix it all up again. May not be as extensive as the first group that went in, but it's still, there's a cost factor to it. So now they've got to figure out what they can buy it at. And they may not buy it at 40,000, maybe they buy it at 50,000, and on a $100,000 note, if you paid, say, $70,000 on it, then you've got all those costs and expenses associated with it. It's really hard. When you're, you're automatically losing money because you spent seventy dollars and they're giving you fifty, dollars and now all of a sudden you got all those expenses. All of a sudden you just lost $20,000 maybe even $40,000 on this particular deal. So where do you gain that back up down the road? How do you gain that back up? Well, do more deals, dollar cost averaging. You gotta stay in the game. And the banks can afford to do those things. As a wholesaler, you don't have to worry about those types of things. Because this is the place where you can earn and learn 
And then you can buy the deals along the way that ultimately fit into your buying matrix and your buying goals and objectives. So that's, that's the cool part. So hopefully this gives you a great understanding about the note wholesaling side of the business. On the next session, we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about how we, how these numbers work, how they look, and how we actually work with the, uh, the sellers on these notes and what that looks like. So we're going to pause here. We're going to take a quick little break, and then uh, we're going to come back, I think, in uh, just a short 20 minutes. So don't go too far. Grab yourself something to snack on, something to drink, and uh, we'll see you guys back here in 20 minutes. All right, take care.